For all of you professional brewers out there, I'm here to let you know that planning brew schedules is easier than ever with Imperial Yeast, who guarantee that commercial orders up to 20 liters of 10, that's right, 10 of their most popular strains will ship free if they're not in stock when you place your order. So in addition to pitching right with the highest quality yeast on the market, they're promising that yeast will be ready when you need it or shipping's on them. A killer deal from an incredible company. Whether you're a pro or a home brewer, if you haven't tried Imperial Yeast in your brewery, it's time to up your game. You can check out everything Imperial Yeast has to offer and place your commercial order at imperialyeast.com. Welcome to the Brew Lab. For a large portion of brewing history, beer was usually made of only malt, water, and hops. It wasn't until the 1880s that we understood the role of yeast. Given the incredible diversity of yeast, wouldn't it be cool if there was an easy, cheap, repeatable, and scalable method for selecting and comparing yeast strains? Well, up to this point, I've done a few episodes uh, discussing novel or at least uncommon yeast strains, like episode three with Dr. Matt Farber, where we discussed the Lachancia yeast species that produces lactic acid. Uh, Episode six with Dr. Matt Winans discussing yeast hybrids and his experiments combining Saccharomyces cerevisiae with a sake strain, uh, Saccharomyces arboricola. And more recently, episode 10 with Dr. Brian Gibson, where we did a survey of uncommon common yeast strains that can be used for bioflavoring or low alcohol, no alcohol beer production. But I wanted to do a show about some of the more common strains that we're familiar with as brewers. And more specifically, I wanted to discuss how brewers might go about selecting the best yeast strain for their beer. So today in the lab, I'm speaking with Dr. Maria Mutsuglu, who is a senior process innovation specialist for Molson Coors. Back in 2018, she put on a presentation at the San Diego Brewing Summit called Expanding Your Yeast Library, Bench Scale Yeast Strain Screening for Performance and Organoleptic Diversification. Now that sounds like a mouthful, but it's really just a method for comparing different yeast strains. And the thing that's impressive about her method is one, its simplicity, but also its scalability. So this episode is going to have tips for brewers of all batch sizes and skill levels. We'll talk about really easy measurements, like how long the specific strain takes to ferment compared to others. And we'll also get more complicated, combining that information with sensory data and even GCMS, gas chromatography mass spectrometry uh, to create heat maps that can help you choose the best yeast for your beer, not just the uh, best yeast for the style of beer that you're brewing. Uh, this is this episode's about taking your beer from 10 to 11. So if that interests you, I think you're really going to enjoy this episode. If you haven't already, please consider becoming a patron of Brewlosophy by visiting patreon.com slash brewlosophy. Depending on your contribution level, you'll receive unique rewards for your support, like access to unpublished contributor recipes, discounts at yakimavalleyhops.com, and an invite to a monthly live Q&A session. To become a patron and get access to these sweet rewards, head over to patreon.com slash brewlosophy. You can also support us by using the links at brewlosophy.com slash support, which give us a small kickback when you make online purchases through our partner vendor websites. Just start your shopping experience by using the links listed at brewlosophy.com slash support. Feedback is brought to you by the clever folks from North America's leading hop supplier, Haas, who developed Incognito, a 100% all-natural hop product crafted to deliver highly concentrated flavor while maximizing brewing efficiency and reducing process loss. Currently available in Citra, Mosaic, Equinot, Sabro, and HBC 472 varieties, Incognito possesses the qualities of high flowability and solubility. Simply open the container, pour the desired amount of liquid, liquid hop concentrate into your wort and that's it all the hoppy goodness you expect without adding any actual hop matter means less process loss and thus increased profits you can learn more about incognito and all of the other innovative products haas has to offer over at john that's john the letter i h a a s Dot com. All right, listener Will commented on Facebook uh, in response to episode nine, Oxygenation in High Gravity Brewing with Dr. Luis Castro. Will says, it seems interesting that the level of dissolved oxygen most brewers shoot for, eight to ten parts per million, is also the same level that produces the most esters. I would have definitely loved to see the preference data to go along with his study. 
Hi, well, yeah, that was a really cool finding on that episode that adding oxygen might mean more robust fermentation, but at the expense of increased esters and aldehyde production. And I, I really liked the way he described oxygenating as a sort of give and take. You know, you get the fermentation performance benefits, uh, but it comes with increased esters and aldehydes which, aldehydes, which some brewers may be absolutely okay with and others may not. So I think that's an interesting comment on all of the tools that we use as brewers to make beer. There's there's kind of, you know, two sides to every coin or a cost benefit benefit analysis of everything that we do. Um, and then the second part of your question about preference data also caught my eye. And I, I agree with you. I really would have liked to have seen some sensory testing as well, especially in connection with the three experiments that we talked about in the episode, which were all non-significant. So that was a single versus double dose of O2, uh, a no O2 versus a single dose. And then the third one was no O2 versus over oxygenating, where we uh, insert the oxygen wand for four minutes. Um, so yeah, in, in Dr. Castro's experiment, there were increased esters and aldehydes at that 8 to 10 ppm level, but was it enough to make a difference? And, uh, you know, I asked him in the episode, the objective results would say yes, but that's why I uh, love doing this. Be great to do some more tens- more sensory, uh, and it's always great to test things, things out. So thanks for listening and for sending in the feedback. Let's take a break. When we come back, we'll be talking to Dr. Maria Mutsaglu about her presentation called Expanding Your Yeast Library, Bench Scale Yeast Strain Screening for Performance and Organoleptic Diversification. Established in 1995, More Beer has been consistently serving the greater brewing community since the times IPA was expected to be bitter and clear. And there are reasons they've stuck around so long. In addition to their massive product selection and excellent customer service, More Beer has locations on both the West and the East Coast of the United States, which translates into fast shipping times regardless of where you live. And when you spend more than $59, shipping is free. When you're in need of brewing ingredients and gear, there's no better option than MoreBeer.com, one of the most trusted shops on the planet. When designing recipes, I'm often surprised when brewers pay careful attention to the exact percentages in the malt bill or plan out a minute-by-minute hop schedule or make tiny gram and milligram adjustments to the water mineral profile and then just pick the yeast that traditionally goes with the style of beer that's being brewed. Uh, It's almost as if yeast, you know, the primary thing that makes beer beer, uh, plays this backseat role to other ingredients, which got me wondering why brewers aren't paying as much attention to yeast as they do other ingredients. So surely there's a method that's simple, easy to use, and repeatable for comparing different yeasts to find that perfect strain for your brew. Well, today in the lab, we've got Dr. Maria Mutsaglu, who outlined a bench scale method for yeast screening and put some science behind it by using the method to compare 10 different American ale strains. Uh, and so, Maria, welcome to the brew lab. Thank you so much, Cade. I'm so happy to be here. Uh, well, this is uh, this is going to be a lot of fun. This episode uh, is based on a presentation you gave in 2018 at the San Diego Brewing Summit uh, while you were working with Sierra Nevada Brewing Company. It's really cool. Um, this is going to be applicable to all level of brewers. Um, and uh, you know, to me, the coolest parts is you actually you know, you, you devised this method and then tried it on 10 different yeasts, ran some tests, and, and we've got those results to talk about today. I'm pretty excited. Yeah, I'm excited too. I think the fact that we can apply this at, you know, different levels. If you're a home brewer, we have some solutions for you. If you're a more complex, high-scale brewer, um, I think this is also something that would be great for you to use. Yeah, and it's cool. We're going to talk both about those things, right? How, you know, the, we'll, we'll get into GC mass spec and HPLC, but also just, you know, comparison of fermentation performance and, and that sort of stuff, which is cool. So, but let's hear a little bit about you to start off with. Um, so, you are now currently at Molson Coors, and there you are a senior process innovation specialist. So, um, first of all, what does a senior process innovation specialist do <laughs> at Molson Coors? <laughs> That's a great question. And, you know, it's quite a complex role, which is why I really enjoy being in it. But most of my role revolves around uh, innovation scouting and testing, with a lot of that focus specifically on the fermentation science side of things. So still within research and development, um, but kind of looking for the best and the newest out there that we could, uh, technology that's out there that we could bring into 
um, you know, Molson cores and see if we can apply it at a commercial scale. Oh, that sounds like a lot of fun. So you get to play with all the fun new gizmos and gadgets. That is correct. It's a ton of fun. <laughs> Very cool. That sounds like oh, that sounds cool. Well, how'd you um, how'd you get involved studying, uh, you know, brewing and fermentation? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Um, I think my path, and I'm sure many other people out there have an atypical path, but it wasn't really straightforward for me. So, you know, in graduate school, uh, for better or worse, <laughs> I spent a lot of time in local pubs uh, working on my dissertation. And <laughs> I really <laughs> grew nice. to, yeah, kind of weird, but it, it worked for me. Um, I really grew to have an appreci- appreciation for those types of spaces that allowed me to study. And I really enjoyed the vibes um, that allowed me to get through what was, you know, a little bit of a stressful time. Um, so I, I don't know if it was the unique mixture of intense science studying and being surrounded by fermented beverages that subliminally guided me to my next steps. But, you know, when it came time for me to make a critical decision in my career path, um, I was f- finishing up grad school in biochemistry. Um, I didn't really know what I wanted to do with my life. I decided to forego the traditional route to professorship uh, and instead applied to basically any wine or brewing science job opening um, that existed, especially those in California. I was really intrigued with the thought of living on the West Coast. Um, And so fortunately, I was hired by Sierra Nevada before I graduated. Um, They definitely took a chance on me since my background was not in fermentation or in brewing. uh, And I'm really grateful for that. And that position is what really started uh, the love affair I have with brewing science. (laughs) Very nice. Uh, So where did you get your, uh, where'd you get your PhD? So I received my PhD from South Dakota State University, um, was born and raised in South Dakota. So that was kind of all I knew. And that's a little bit of what drove me to kind of explore uh, other areas. Oh, yeah. So South Dakota over to uh, California. Uh, that was a big change, Correct. I'm sure. <laughs> it was. But a good one, I'm It sure. was good, yeah. yes. Uh, good. Well, excellent. Cool. Well, let's um, let's hop into the study then. Um, so again, this was a, uh, a presentation that you did in 2018 at the San Diego Brewing Summit about you know uh, ways to compare and screen yeast. So first question I've got for you is why uh, why did you decide to do a presentation on this topic? So I chose to do a presentation on yeast screening because uh, you know truly nothing excited me more in my role uh, with Sierra Nevada and in you know my introduction to brewing science than to discover what different yeast species and strains could do for me and and the products I was working with both in terms of you know unique flavor generation but also thinking about uh, solving pro- uh, problems within process or in production. Um, and so, you know, I thought if I could share the method that I used to screen yeast for various uh, project targets or brand targets, you know, maybe others could be infected with um, kind of a similar passion for exploring new yeast strains. Yeah, I, I love it. I like that. Infecting people. I, I love talking about like yeast and, <laughs> and it infecting uh, people with this passion. That's a great, great way to do it. I love it. <laughs> well, that's, it was definitely purposeful. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it, it's a it's a great topic, you know, and one of the things that I loved about your presentation that you talked about in there was um, they're, they're so, you know, it's I, I'm not trying to like poo poo on yeast vendors, but there's really limited information out there whenever you look at like what yeast, you know, what it, what it says. Like, I, I think you gave a great example. There was an Irish ale yeast, um, which the description just sort of said, great for stouts, porters and brown ales, medium attenuation and esters round out the profile. And it's like, great. Basically, you told me that it's going to turn, you know, alcohol in or it's going to turn sugars into alcohol and it'll produce esters. Thank you. <laughs> right. Like that, all yeast do this. <laughs> exactly. Right. Yeah, you're you're exactly right. I mean, you know, far be it for me to dictate how commercial vendors display, you know, what the yeasts are offering. Um, and you know, there are so many yeasts that are out there that are commercially available. And so, you know, it makes sense to some extent for them not to be able to define specifically what the yeast can bring to the table, um, because we know that's dependent on recipe, process condition, scale, even as we're talking about here and also individual yeast handling. Um, So, you know, it's really difficult to parse from what's offered from commercial vendors to what you think will um, occur as you bring that into your, bring yeast strains into your brewery. Um, And, you know, besides the commercial vendors, which at least give you some indication of what the yeast can do for you, there are so many yeast strains available in yeast banks um, that uh, these strains that have been isolated from brewing and wine environments or even nature, as we found out, uh, with a sour yeast strain that um, was talked about in one of the earlier episodes here. 
those types of uh, yeast banks do not offer any information on yeast at all. So you really have no indication of what um, those types of strains can do for you. Uh, so it, it's really, I think, important for brewers to be able to have um, a method to be able to devise and predict what the yeast are going to do as they move them into their larger scale uh, fermentations. Well, that's cool. So so using this method, we can predict how our yeast is going to scale up. And so I, just, I guess a real basic question there, does it actually work? You know, are the, is the method going to uh, do use accurate predictions when we scale it up? So it, it's a bit of a complicated answer, I would say, for that. So the method will allow you to gain an understanding of yeast performance before scale up. Um, and what that means is that it's not necessarily true that what we see in uh, you know, a small scale be that 0.5 liters, which is what we used here, 5 liters or 50 liters, that we're going to see an exact mirrored performance at each of those stages. But what it can do for you is allow you to conduct an early risk assessment at a very cost-effective stage before you jump into more cost-prohibitive scales, where if you do incur a failure, it might result in significant costs. And I think a really great thing about it is that it allows you to explore so many more variables than you could at these higher cost prohibitive scales. And that really increases your chances of succeeding in innovation, um, you know, with respect to either new products or even innovation within your processes. Okay, I like that. Yeah, so it's a it's a risk assessment strategy for commercial brewers, and then you know even for home brewers, it's just uh, you know looking at different different yeasts and how they might work in your brew, right? Even at the five gallon scale, or or you know um, uh, at those smaller smaller levels. I kind of like that because. I, uh, I, I've talked about it several times on this show and on our other show, the Brilosophy podcast that I, you know, Imperial yeast has this yeast called harvest, which it's a German lager yeast. And that is absolutely my go-to, uh, lager yeast. And I, and, and so I kind of wanted to ask you this question as well. So why would I want to change that? Why would I want to compare it against anything else? I love it. <laughs> I'm sure that Harvest by Imperial is an absolutely fantastic German lager strain. So I would never take that away from you. <laughs> but uh, I guess I take this approach to that question. You can't love what you don't know. Um, and you also can't know what you don't know. So, you know, I would challenge you, Cade, to step away from Harvest for a second and give yourself the opportunity to see what else is out there. I mean, you might find something uh, that fulfills a brewing desire in you that you didn't even know you had. So, you know, to the brewers listening out there, I, I really recommend that you go forth and explore. It, if you call yourself a master brewer, I think you need to be a master of yeast as well to claim that true title. Um, I mean, even with this podcast, as we mentioned, uh, that there's been talk about sour yeast that can contribute really nice lactic acid flavors to beers. There also was an episode about the selective hybridization of uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae with uh, sake yeast strains. And as you know, listeners are hearing this awesome information about these new and innovative uh, yeast products. How many of them are actually going to take up the challenge to try something new and you know bring those strains in house and and see if they can do something for you that you you might not have known existed in the past? So, I guess that I would take that approach to just have an open mind. And you know, if it if it turns out that harvest is it works for you, at least you now have the knowledge uh, in your hand that. You have all of these other strains you've tried. Maybe a new product uh, would would be really nice to use a different strain with. So, just kind of my my take on it. <laughs> oh no, I love that. I love that. I I don't. I can't love something that I don't know that it exists yet. Right? Like maybe there's a better strain out there that I'm going to love um, even more. And actually, you know, that's a f a fantastic example, right? Because I used I I didn't always brew with Harvest as my German lager strain. Um, I used other lager strains, and now I like Harvest better. <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's uh, that's fantastic. I love it. All right, well let's um let's hop into this methodology. So again, this is a bench scale uh, methodology again, convertible you know from from all levels of brewers. But uh, the first thing I think that's really cool is that this method is so budget friendly. I mean, you don't need that many tools. So go ahead and tell us what do we need? Like what what tools do we need to be able to do this? Yeah. So I, I mean, depending on what materials you have available. If you're a home brewer, there's ways that we can run these types of screens at a very cost uh, effective um, sort of way. So some of the things that I think you need are uh, fermenters, obviously. Um, and in this case, uh, even in Sierra Nevada and, and you know, likely as I work with Molson Coors, the vessel that 
um, I've been using is a simple mason jar. So often used for canning. Um, the reason why I like mason jars is you can get them in multiple shapes. You can get them in multiple volumes, but I know that they're a glass that can withstand uh, pressure, uh, heat, and uh, acidity. So it, it just makes a really nice, really simple, cheap um, fermentation vessel. Uh, and then obviously sanitation is critical. The pressure cooker is um, a, a kitchen tool that you could use to mimic a standard autoclave, which is what we often use in the lab. Um, but you could also use uh, chemical sanitization if you'd like. Certainly the mason jars should be able to withstand uh, chemical sanitization. Um, you know, with respect to the jar enclosure, you can use the lid that comes along with a mason jar. You just need to bore a hole in the top, maybe about one millimeter. Um, and that allows for CO2 escape. If, you know, the lids aren't something you like working with, you can use parafilm, uh, you can use foil. Um, so there are, are multiple different ways that you could um, enclose these vessels as long as you have uh, a hole for the CO2 to escape. Uh, and then finally, you know, a method for assessing um, the fermentation progress, since we're, it's not recommended to sample into these, you know, small scale fermenters to try to take something like an apparent extract measurement um, or even cell counts or try to do sensory. You want to, you know, avoid dipping your fingers into them, um, you know, because of microbial spoilage risk, but also due to the limited volumes that we're working with. Uh, what I would recommend is purchasing a scale, um, a digital scale. These are oftentimes found in the kitchen where sections of, of websites and, and grocery stores and things like that. Um, you will use the scale to measure the mass of the fermenter with time because as CO2 escapes, you're going to lose mass uh, from your fermenter. And I'm sure we'll get into this a little bit later, but uh, you know, one thing I do want to say for the digital scale, you want to make sure that it can measure up to the hundredths place. That's going to give you the uh, weight resolution that you need to really see the progress as uh, fermentation moves forward. Ah, I see. Well, that's amazing. So really, you know, mason jar fermenters, a lid and a scale um, and some method for sanitizing the fermenter. And that's it. That's all you need to get started. I, I, I think that's amazing. Uh, just thinking about how simple it is to 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 do something like this. Well, let's um let's talk about the method. Why don't you sort of walk us through uh, the method? And I'll probably pop in with some questions um, as you kind of go through it. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, what I like to do in this case is to have a single batch of wort that uh, I'm going to use for these types of screens. And, you know, typically if I'm not looking at um, recipe screening, which is something you can also do at this stage, Brewing one big batch of wort is really helpful because it will uh, ensure that you're using a consistent media throughout your screen. Um, you know, we are eliminating potential raw materials uh, bias and also theoretically eliminating waste, particularly if you uh, collect what you don't use and freeze it for later screens. So as long as you're collecting in, in a sanitary um, sort of container and you're freezing it immediately, you know, pull that uh, frozen wart out, defrost it, and, you know, continue on with your screening in, in a new sort of situation. So brew a single batch of wart, collect it. Um, and uh, the way that we add it to the fermenters, obviously, you want to be as sanitary as possible. You know, if you don't have a uh, biological hood, um, you can light a gas uh, sort of flame to um, draw away any potential uh, spoiler organisms that might be in the atmosphere. Um, but try to make your conditions as sanitary as possible as you um, aliquot your wort into your autoclaves or sanitized uh, mason jars. Now, if you don't have volumetric glassware to use, you can simply use your scale and add the same mass of wort to each of your fermenters. Um, you want to make sure that the liquid is uh, a consistent amount, can be volume, can be mass, it's certainly easy enough. Uh, you will want to ensure that if you are running this method, you know, well past when the uh, wort was brewed, um, so you, you've likely lost a lot of oxygen if you were oxygenating that wort, you want to ensure that you get as much oxygen back into solution um, prior to yeast pitch as you can. You can do this by uh, parafilming or closing off the vessel and doing a very vigorous inversion. You're obviously going to get some foaming with the wort you know, let it settle down before you move on. But uh, certainly you want to try to force as much oxygen from the atmosphere into solution as possible. Um, finally, you'll remove the parafilm and you'll pitch the yeast at a consistent rate, which can be challenging in and of itself, um, especially if you're running this as a home brewer. I think there are ways that we can address trying to be as consistent as possible. Certainly if you have a lab uh, that you're working with, there are, are ways to ensure greater consistency. Um, but you'll... 
add your yeast, repair from the vessel. You'll want to invert to homogenize. This makes sure that the yeast is um, the same concentration throughout the solution. And then the final thing that you do before you allow your fermentations to get off and running is to record the mass of the vessel. So this is the mass of the vessel at time zero. You're adding your all the whole fermenter to the scale, recording it, and we can think of that as an OG reading. Now, not necessarily that we are going to convert the uh, mass to an OG, just think of that as a time zero data point for your fermentation before the yeast starts to chew through the sugar and generate CO2. Um, so, you know, finally, you'll want to ensure that you're recording the mass of the vessel during fermentation. You can certainly do this as often as you want. I think in my presentation, I had listed three to four times per day until the mass lost is less than 0.5 grams per day. I've now modified, you know, through the evolution of working with this method, I like to look at less than 0.5 grams per day before I crash chill uh, my fermenters. Um, and the reason for, you know, three to four times per day for monitoring <laughs> the mass, it's really going to be critical if you are running uh, nonlinear regression or modeling on the fermentation curves. If you're not using any mathematical assessment of fermentation curves and you're just looking to see when the fermentation is complete, you know, once a day is totally fine. So really all we're doing is putting wort into uh, different mason jars and letting it ferment, right, with different yeast. I mean, that's a that's a, 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 a an oversimplification, um, an intentional oversimplification, <laughs> I guess I would say. Uh, but 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 yeah, I mean, this method sounds like it's totally usable for for everybody, right? I mean, all you know, you, you don't really need, you know, uh, um you know, like you said, a, a vent hood or anything like that. If you have it, that's amazing. And and that's what I love about this is it's so usable from, you know, just in your kitchen, you can do this. But if you have a lab and you have quality controls or, you know, um, the ability to maintain sanitary uh, lab equipment and hoods and, and you know, like you said, volumetric glassware and everything, you can really take this scale and make it, um, you can science the heck out of it, right? <laughs> that's correct. I mean, you know, far be it for me to claim that I've you know, come up with this method. Perhaps I've perfected it for what I think it's useful for. But a lot of the peer-reviewed literature that's out there oftentimes relies on, you know, this level of scale for fermentation assessment. So we're really taking what's being currently done in, in you know, the university labs and the high-level research labs, and we're just making it applicable to brewing and applicable from, you know, the, the, the basic, most basic home brewer to a level of, you know, something like Molson cores. It's really applicable to a wide range of people, and it's really based on good scientific technique. Now, now that, that's that's great, too. And one of the things that you mentioned was that, um, you know, you can use a, a wort that's been frozen, right? Like, so you don't have to do this um, every time you brew, but I could sort of see a interesting thing that you could do if you don't want to say you know ruin a whole batch uh, even at a homebrew scale even if you don't want to ruin five gallons um, um, uh, or you know 20 liters of wort uh, you could just take off a small aliquot of the wort and pitch a different yeast in it and just see how that compares right absolutely and I, I love that take uh, Cade on on the situation I mean you don't need a, a 10 yeast strains to run at the same time. You don't have to make this a whole shindig. If you just want to, you know, take some wort from a batch that you've, you're already doing for a scaled fermentation, take a little bit of that off and throw it in a mason jar. And if you have a yeast in the fridge that you're eager to see what it can do, add it in, ferment it, and get a preliminary assessment. It, do it doesn't have to be, you know, this, this complicated thing. So I really like that approach. Yeah, cool. All right. Well, um, let's then talk now too about, all right, we've got our yeast in the mason jars. What are some different tests that we can run uh, on them to figure out, you know, or to compare these yeasts against each other? So there's a few things that we can do. Um, you know, we can, we want to run, I guess, assessments from different levels. We want to assess how it's performing in the fermenter. We want to see, you know, what is the alcohol it's genera generating? Did we get good attenuation? And then there's, of course, uh, sensory assessments. And then depending on the level of um, resources that you have available to you, perhaps you scale that even further into, uh, you know, more expensive, I would call them, um, methods like GCMS for volatile profile analysis, HPLC for carbohydrate profiling. But taking it from, I guess, the basic level of, you know, how, how do we make some, um, how do we gain information on how these yeasts are performing in fermentation? Uh, the way that we do that is through, as I mentioned, monitoring the CO2 production of these yeasts 
um, using the mass of the fermenter. Uh, so wh what we can do with that is if, if you're someone who is familiar with nonlinear regression, uh, you can use the data that you're collecting with time um, to fit curves to your data set. So, you know, if you take a look at, for example, the um, mass by loss or mass by volume loss um, plotted against the fermentation time from my presentation, you'll notice that there are, that these curves are shifted willy nilly up and down. And that's because the fermenters are not going to all be the same weight. Um, you'll have different, uh, um, you'll have different uh, weights for them. And so it's really hard to just visually look at the plot and make some guesstimation on what, uh, how the yeasts are fermenting with respect to time. And the reason why I think this is so critical is, especially if you're a larger scale brewery, kinetics are an absolutely critical thing to understand. Uh, if you're trying to meet a certain capacity, you want tank turnover to be as fast as possible. Um, you don't want to take, uh, you don't want to select a strain that's going to ferment for two weeks if you only have 11 days um, within a fermentation cycle. So, you know, instead of just visually assessing the plot and, and what I'm talking about here, not only can be applicable to uh, this bench scale method using the mass of the fermenter, but think of the application with respect to a parent extract. If you're monitoring this at a large scale, you can apply this curve fitting to ethanol generation. Um, you can apply it to cell production, uh, cell, cell production and flocculation. There's really a lot of things you can do with curve fitting. Um, but essentially what it does is it, instead of trying to eyeball when you think fermentation is complete, by applying nonlinear regression techniques, the data, the kinetic data can be summed up to a single numerical point, um, which the, so essentially you're making the math work for you. And what that allows you to do is to take that single data point and now compare it to all of your other uh, data points with respect to fermentation time so that you now have a really good numerical and quantitative way to assess differences. So with this specific data point that I'm talking about, um, a, a general curve fit is going to give you something called the midpoint of fermentation, which is essentially an inflection point um, in the curve. Uh, so I find that to be a really nice way. It's not the easiest way, I'll admit, um, but it's a really nice way to be able to quantitatively assess fermentation time. And to the people listening out there, um, Dr. Robert, Al <laughs> Dr. Robert Alexander Spears has a lot of publications uh, surrounding uh, nonlinear regression and curve fitting to bring uh, trend graphs. Um, I also think he was participated in the ASBC method um, so there's certainly a lot of literature out there for you to explore um, if you want to try to take these techniques in-house. So that was a really long-winded way of saying that we have some methods of monitoring fermentation time um, that I think are really critical. Uh, and certainly, you know, there are a lot more things we are looking at here for devising um, ways of telling differences between these yeast strains. Yeah, I love it. So let's then look at your study. So you looked at um, 10 different yeasts, 10 different common yeasts. Do you want to run through real quick what those 10 yeasts were? Yes. So the first yeast strain that is maybe the most critical is a control yeast that you are very familiar with, um, that you've used in your brewery before. Kate, for your example, it would be harvest maybe if you're running a lager screen. Um, but you want to use a, a strain that you're familiar with at a high scale. It really will give you a good, good indication of what that scale down effect is doing for you. So in this case, we selected Sierra Nevada House Ale. Um, it's a house ale strain uh, used in Sierra Nevada for a lot of ale fermentations. Very familiar with it. And then nine other uh, ale strains were chosen from a few different commercial vendors um, that we thought looked interesting. So it was kind of, it was extremely random. Um, and again, just based on some preliminary uh, whatever they were saying in, in their descriptions and, and we select them and went with them. I like it. I like it. I'm going to read through a couple of those real quick because I think listeners are going to um, be familiar with a bunch of these yeasts. So um, 1827 Nottingham was one. Uh, y yeast 1056 Chico. Uh, or I uh, That's my, uh, <laughs> I guess I should say that's Cade saying that it's the Chico strain. I, have, I don't have any inside <laughs> information that 1056 is Chico. Um, but that's just Cade saying that it's commonly held belief that 1056 is Chico. Um, you have Y-Yeast 1272, which is American Ale 2. Um, Y-Yeast 1217, which is their West Coast IPA. Uh, Y-Yeast 1010 American Wheat. Uh, WLP, which is White Labs 090 uh, San Diego Super Yeast. Then you did um, the Conan uh, Vermont Ale, which I think was from 
BSI. Was that where you got that from? That sounds correct. Yeah, doesn't really matter. I think that's also a uh, barbarian from Imperial Yeast, uh, that Conan variant. And then um, Hothead and Voss uh, uh, from Omega Yeast Labs. Uh, Voss is a Kvike, and I think Hothead is a Kvike as well. But um, anyway, so some really, really interesting variability there, right? Like you would hope to see uh, by using these that there's some some differences and maybe some surprising things that we can figure out uh, uh, when using these yeasts. So I'm uh, I'm really interested to see uh, what these yeasts did and and uh, you know check out and see what what results you had and and science this thing. So uh, let's take a quick break and when we come back uh, we'll look at those yeasts. Being the primary driver of fermentation, yeast plays an important role in the outcome of the beer, both in terms of fermentation performance, like alcohol and residual sugar concentration, and sensory characteristics, like esters, phenols, and higher alcohols. Well, today we're talking with Dr. Maria Mutsaglu uh, about a simple method to screen and select yeast or yeasts uh, that are best for your beer. Uh, So right before we went to break, we uh, ran through the list of 10 different yeast strains uh, that Dr. Mutsaglu compared against each other using her benchtop, uh, you know, mason jar uh, uh, method. And let's now talk about how these uh, these beers went differently. So um, you kind of split your presentation into two aspects. One was sort of a fermentation analysis and then a uh, sensory uh, flavor and aroma uh, type analysis. So let's let's continue with that here. Let's start with fermentation analysis and let's talk about just some basic things. How'd they attenuate? Yeah, we saw quite a variety of attenuation um, in these strains with a couple of surprises, I would say. So the best attenuator that we saw was Hothead Ale, which I think, Kate, you mentioned was a a Quebec, which I had no idea. But it it makes sense when you think about it, that it's a very supposed to be a very thermal tolerant uh, ale strain. And, um, you know, in this case, we didn't test thermal tolerance, but uh, what I did see was that it had really great attenuation and it was also the fastest uh, attenuator. Um, so it really speaks to probably the physiological fitness of that strain. Um, and, you know, what was surprising is that the other Quebec, and am I, I hope I'm saying that right. I love Quebec and I, I've never understood how to pronounce oh, it. No, me so. either. Don't worry about it at all. I'm sure I <laughs> pronounce it wrong too. I need to get somebody on. Maybe I can get Lars Garshall on uh, the podcast and just just do an episode about how to pronounce Quebec or Kvike or however it's said. Please do that because I would certainly listen. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, what I wanted to say was that, you know, we saw the best attenuation with Hothead Ale, um, but we actually saw the worst attenuation with the Voss yeast, um, which was a little bit surprising because, again, you know, I think the Kuvacs are supposed to be very resistant to stress, which, um, you know, in in scaled conditions, certainly there might be stressors uh, that are impacting the performance here. But, um, you know, the reason, one of the reasons I think why Hothead Ale is also a really great attenuator is that we found out that it actually over attenuated. So it does appear to be uh, STA1 positive or positive for a uh, dextrin utilization capability. So it under attenuated, or I'm sorry, it over attenuated compared to all other strains. Interesting. Wow. That's amazing. So, yeah. Um, uh, then how about um, from, you know, uh, some of the other uh, the metrics. What about, so if we've had one that was a high attenuator, then I would assume it would be a similar one for ABV uh, production or maybe not. Nope. You're, you're absolutely on the dot there. All right. <laughs> Attenuation was almost uh, directly correlated to ABV. And, you know, the only way we would see that not be a direct correlation is if one of these strains somehow came up with a super ethanol yield where they were consuming the same amount of sugars, but maybe they ramped up the amount of ethanol they were able to produce with the same concentration. In this case, we really didn't see that play out. Okay. Uh, is there, this is a, a, a question that I have just sort of generally, and maybe, maybe you, you know, maybe you don't, but is there an easy way to calculate um, ABV? Uh, you, know, you know, just if you're, I, I mean, I don't know, is this, maybe I'll just ask that open-ended question. Is there an easy way to calculate ABV? So if you don't have a method for quantifying alcohol and, you know, most typically we see that as beer alkalizer analysis, which gives you um, direct ABV, can give you ABW, can give you real extract, you know, you don't need that expensive equipment to still get some indication of ABV. So if you're capable of quantifying OG and AE using a hydrometer, 
Um, there are calculations that exist that are fairly straightforward. I think if you use Excel or Google Sheets, if you don't have an Excel license, um, you can uh, you know, punch those numbers in and get an ABV out. There's also uh, ABV calculators online. Most of them rely on the same equation, so they should be fairly consistent between the source of the calculator. You know, just keep in mind that the equation does rely on some assumptions, um, and it may not reflect the true ABV value. Okay, I see. So, so here we've we've started. You know, I, and I love starting at this area because right, these are just two basic metrics: uh, how the uh, you know how the yeast attenuated, and then the alcohol that was produced um, as a result of that attenuation. And that's something that that every brewer uh, should be able to do. Right, all you need there is your, like you said, your OG measurements, your FG measurements, and then a, a, a calculator, um, and you can you can figure out those two metrics and compare those against each other. And this one was really cool because I was reminded of a uh, brewlosophy experiment that we did where we actually compared bread yeast, which was like Fleischmann's active dry yeast, which is a, a, a yeast that's available here in grocery stores for, for bread. Um, versus USO5, um, which is a fairly popular, uh, you know, ale yeast strain. And from like an objective standpoint, it was pretty interesting. Uh, they both had the same OG because it was one batch of wort. So it was a 1.054 um, or 13.3 degrees Play-Doh. Um, and then the flash, the the Fleischmann's active dry yeast went all the way down to 1.09 or 2.3 Play-Doh, while the USO5 uh, didn't actually finish as high. So the USO5 didn't attenuate as well um, as the bread yeast did, which was sort of surprising. It was almost a, um, you know, it was, let's see, six specific gravity points or one and a half degrees Play-Doh different. And that resulted in an ABV difference of uh, 6 po- 6.0 ABV uh, to 5.3, which is about a 0.7 uh, ABV difference. Now, again, that's calculated ABV. Obviously, we didn't measure it um, exactly, but but that's a huge that's a huge difference. Um, you know, just on those two yeasts. Now, again, you know, I, I'm not sure how many people are brewing with bread yeast, uh, but USO5 <laughs> is pretty pretty uh, significant yeast, and this one was really. Uh, you know, kind of a good example of what you can do by comparing yeasts, right? Oh, absolutely. What a fantastic experiment. I, I, I really love, I love it. I love the setup. Um, and, you know, I, I think it's, it's actually a good segue into what I hope is not a tangent, but, you know, looking at the results that you got here, why, you know, if we speculate why the active dried yeast would finish lower than the uh, you know, standard brewing yeast, um, it has a lot to do with yeast handling. So uh, that's one piece uh, that, you know, isn't very heavily talked about in my presentation, but is absolutely critical to the results that you're finding out from your experiment. So if we take a look at your, uh, the yeast that you use and maybe extrapolate some, some assumptions, active dried yeast is commonly propagated using aerobic respiration in very nutritive media, even at these huge scales where they're making, you know, commercial varieties. So, you know, whether or not you're using bread yeast or using active dried yeasts that are from wine or from brewing, the physiological state of those yeasts is going to be very different from what you get from harvested yeast, either from a brewing environment or even yeast that you're propagated in a brewing environment. So this is an absolutely fantastic example of being able to use this method to assess, you know, different sources of yeast strains, different types of yeast, um, and really showcases that yeast handling is absolutely critical in in the results that you're seeing here. So I, I absolutely love this experiment. Huh, I love it. Now, now, uh, now, I think I'm, we may have some more explanations about, you know, we've done other experiments where we've compared like USO5 to WLP001, um, which are supposed to be sort of the same strain, right? But d- but different uh, different manufacturers and had some interesting results there as well. That's amazing. I love that you brought that up, that yeast handling is such an important thing. So yet another uh, opportunity for you to test your yeast, um, and, you know, even if you are aware that the strains may be similar across suppliers, maybe the, you know, you have a little bit of supplier bias or, you know, a supplier, um, you know, uh, does a little bit better for your brewery for whatever reason. Uh, and that's fantastic. A, a good way to be able to compare those. Well, let's, um, let's talk now about some more advanced metrics. So you talked a little bit uh, uh, about the midpoint of attenuation. Um, and if I understood you correctly, I think you were saying this one's really useful for commercial brewers because you can, um, it helps you sort of predict how long it's going to take to ferment a beer. So you can turn tanks over and increase your throughput. Is that a fair 
uh, summary? That is absolutely fair and right on point. You know, if the purpose of your screen is to see if you can find a strain that will improve tank turnover by reducing kinetics, um, the nonlinear regression is a great application for being able to answer that question. I love it. And and this one's also too, I mean, I sort of think of a real basic example for home brewers, especially home brewers that are competing and brewing a whole bunch of beers, you know, back to back to back to get bottles ready so that the beer's as fresh as possible for shipping to competitions. You know, this is also something that's really interesting too, that you can do just as a home brewer. If you know that this is how long this yeast taste to, takes to ferment, and I can, you know, uh, taste these and they taste the same, but one ferments two days or three days faster. You, even as a home brewer, you can turn over beers much quicker. Absolutely. Well, cool. And then, um, all right. So there's also one uh, that you talked about in your paper, which is real degree of fermentation. And that's a term that I've heard a lot, but I got to be honest, uh, I don't know exactly what real degree of fermentation means. Can you tell me what it is and why it's important? <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. So real degree of fermentation at its most basic is it's essentially defined as the percent of the total available extract. So think of that in terms of your OG that was utilized by yeast. So if you think of 100% RDF or 100% real degree of fermentation would equate to a yeast converting a 13 Plato OG down to a zero Plato real extract. Um, so this is really important to understand as a comparison metric. I mean, we can use this to define the ability of the yeast to attenuate to completion or even to over attenuate as we saw with hothead ale. Um, but to determine or calculate RDF, you do need to measure the final uh, beer real extract or RE, not the apparent extract. And if you can't measure real extract, you can use a more assumption-based approach which is uh, the apparent degree of fermentation, which is often used. Uh, I think it's a fair, a fair calculation to use, a fair co correlation to RDF. But we do know that AE or apparent extract is also dependent on alcohol. Um, that value is influenced by the level of alcohol. So keep in mind, if your yeasts have uh, different ethanol yields, like we talked about, we didn't see that here, but you know the potential is there. Um, and if they have different ethanol yields, some are producing higher or lower alcohol from the same number of sugars consumed, the apparent degree of fermentation will not be able to account for that difference. So again, it's a little bit more of an assumption-based method, but absolutely applicable if you're not able to measure real extract. It's definitely a value you can use to determine or assess attenuation. Okay, cool. And this real degree of fermentation is what you're using also to determine where the midpoint uh, was. So not, not exactly. The real degree of fermentation is... I would call what I would call an, an endpoint measurement. So it's it's only looking at either pre or post uh, fermentation values. It doesn't take into account any of the kinetic data whatsoever. Okay. Um, so so it, if that makes sense, uh, it, it doesn't involve any kinetic data. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I see. I guess I was thinking that oh, you have to know the endpoint to be able to determine the midpoint. But no, you're taking uh, measurements you know, three or four times a day. So you know exactly when the midpoint is. You can look across your data set and say, here's the point <laughs> where... That's exactly right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, there we go. I, all right, I think I got it now. I, I, um, so, I, I, so I have some questions then. So uh, if we're looking at the midpoint of attenuation, which um, yeast strains did the best? So the yeast strains that did the best were, um, and what we can really do is take a look at that by plot, um, which I know we didn't talk about the uh, rate of mass loss or the catabolic rate, which you can also calculate using nonlinear regression. Um, but we can plot essentially these uh, uh, mathematically derived metrics that are describing the entirety of the kinetic curve. And we can start to see which strains are doing better or which are doing worse. So let's just say with respect to midpoint, our target is really to have a fast fermenter. If we take a look at how these strains performed, you know, we see some clusters forming where we had some really fast ones and some really slow ones. So I think the fastest that we saw, um, which was indicative of the smallest midpoint was WI1010. I think I misspoke and said it was hothead ale. That one is actually a really slow fermenter, um, which is crazy because it had really great attenuation. But uh, yeah, I think we had WI1010 as the fastest uh, and the slowest. We actually had a cluster of a bunch that were quite slow in their fermentation. Um, so, you know, there's four or five strains that clustered together there. 
Yeah, that's cool. And those, I'll just kind of run through those real quick. Those, those four or five that clustered together, I think, was uh, Y East ten fifty six. That's what I'm calling Chico Conan or uh, Barbarian, which is an IPA yeast. Um, and you had uh, Y East twelve seventy two, which is American Ale two, um, Hothead, and uh, San Diego Super Yeast uh, were all uh, very slow. So that's sort of interesting. You know, I, I kind of see San Diego Super Yeast is supposed to be a really high. Uh, attenuator, and I guess you said Hothead was a high attenuator. Interesting that those two are grouped together. Makes me kind of wonder if those strains are more similar uh, than people realize. You may be absolutely right, and I think some of the data that we have uh, in the analyses we'll be talking about will be able to definitively answer that. <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah, and then I then you had some, um, you know, you you had some uh, sort of mid range ones, which were the Sierra Nevada House, and then Y East West Coast IPA. Um, and mm-hmm. then, yeah, uh, it looks like actually Nottingham was one of the faster um, yeast, which I'm kind of surprised by. Yeah, I mean, truly, uh, it comes down to where you're sourcing the yeast and how you're using it. I mean, if I had propagated Nottingham, for example, maybe it would have been a little bit slower or maybe it would have been faster. So it, it's really, you really have to take it into context of where you're getting your yeast and the context of the experiment itself. So I think some things turn out surprising, um, but you know, in context of the experiment, it oftentimes will make sense. Cool. Well, now you're now you're making me want to you know do all this over again a bunch of times and then average it all and see what we can what we can say. You know, maybe even use it across suppliers and stuff. Uh, but that's probably outside the scope of this episode. <laughs> uh, well, all right. So that's a, a pretty good understanding of different. Uh, you know, fermentation performance metrics that we can look at at the yeast. Um, let's look at uh, some sensory analysis. Why don't you start us off there with a couple of, you know, some of the more basic things uh, we can test and then we'll get into more um, advanced. Yeah. So if, you know, again, you're a home brewer or a brewery that you don't have a formally trained panel at the very basic, you can as- at least use um, yourself and other tasters who are familiar with tasting beer products Um, and get their opinions on, you know, things like intensity comparisons of specific compounds. Maybe you're really interested in hearing feedback on a tropical character. So so you can ask your panel or your friends (laughs) to rate um, the tropical character. Um, If you're able to have, you know, more of a trained panel, uh, you can run um, descriptive analysis. Um, So that would be, uh, that would give you information in a quantitative sort of uh, way. Um, a quantitative analysis of specific flavor compounds and flavor aroma profiles. Uh, And then you can also do things like um, true to brain ranking. This would be a really great method to use if you're screening a yeast to meet a similar profile to a strain you already use, but maybe you're trying to find one that ferments faster. Uh, True to brand ranking would really be an appropriate method um, in that case. So really it's, it's up to you based on the resources you have available. What is the level of sensorial screening that you can apply You know, obviously from a a very high level, the quantitative descriptive analysis is really great to give you that statistical information, but it's not absolutely necessary. Um, Certainly, you know, the brewers out there are trained at tasting their own beers. They probably know it best, maybe even better than a trained panel would. So I I just encourage you to taste everything. (laughs) I love it. Taste everything. That's absolutely what I tell everybody to taste it all the way through from the mash all the way to the end of the, uh, to the, to the glass. Uh, yeah, and that's really interesting too, because you know you've got a bunch of different methods there. Like you said, true to brand ranking. So that's where you're just giving a description of the brand and then asking people, does this beer fit the brand? Um, you know, you can do that even as a home brewer. Just say, hey, I brewed an American IPA. Does this taste like an American IPA? <laughs> um, and hopefully they'll be able to tell you uh, yes or no. You can do even what Brewlosophy does, right? Like the triangle test, where we're just comparing two beers and saying are these objectively different? Um, and, you know, there was one experiment that really uh, surprised me when it came out, and that was when we compared um, y, uh, YLP-001, which is kal uh, with US-05. And everything that I have read or had read on the internet, again, not official sources at all, um, is that those are both Chico strains. Um, and so when we compared them together... Uh, uh, it was fascinating. Tasters were actually able to tell them apart. Um, and it turned out six liked Cal Ale, uh, five liked US 05. 
Um, and then four of them either said that they had no preference or there was no difference, which is about as equal as you can get in terms of preference. So even though people were able to tell the difference, really, the preference data was just kind of all over the place. I think that's sort of a, a really interesting example of that. Yeah, I, I love it. And again, you know, it comes down to if if somebody is commercializing or advertising a strain as a certain, you know, species, let's say a Chico strain, it might not perform like a Chico strain that you're used to once you bring it in house. And, and that's, you know, maybe due to their handling, but really that's where this type of methodology comes into play. It gives you an understanding that, you know, I, I don't want to say don't trust the vendor, but bring the trust in house and make sure that you are informed uh, before you put something at a larger scale. Oh, there, that's the key, right? Make sure you're informed, make sure you have the information available before you uh, ramp this thing up to large scale. I, you know, really all brewers, you know, from home brewers, starting brewers, Sierra Nevadas, Colson, or, you know, Molson Coors, everybody should take that to heart really. Right. I mean, make sure you know what yeast it is that you're using. Don't just throw it in because you, you, you think that's what you're supposed to do, I guess. Absolutely. <laughs> um, oh, well, all right. And then one of the more fascinating things um, uh, that I think we get to do as commercial brewers and, you know, as you and I as brewing scientists is we get to uh, science the heck out of this stuff, right? We get to do GCMS and HPLC and then run, um, you know, descriptive panels and, uh, and, and combine all of that data, uh, into useful metrics. And you did that in, in your paper. And so let's talk a little bit about what you found, uh, when combining all of it together. Yeah. So, you know, in a more advanced assessment of these, we did run, as you say, GCMS analysis to get volatile profile data and then obviously descriptive analysis, and then including the data that we collected from fermentation. We have to now think, now that we've done all of this hard work, how do we analyze the data and make informed decisions about what that data is telling us? It would be really difficult, but you know, maybe doable to try to piecemeal go through each individual data point to try to rationalize you know, in your head, well, I think this strain is better or worse, or this one is similar or different. Um, instead, you know, in this case, and as scientists, like you said, Cade, you know, we can use the tools that we have at hand to do the work for us. I like to think work smarter, not harder. Uh, that's that's what we're doing in this case. Um, so uh, I use two different methods here. The first is hierarchical clustering analysis, and then the second is principal component analysis. So the hierarchical clustering is essentially a statistical method that will develop a heat map um, using all of the metrics that you input to the statistical program. That would be strain identity, and then all of the individual data points that you collected, uh, descriptive fermentation GCMS, um, and uh, the color is associated to the intensity of the value, and all of the values are normalized to the color scale. So something that was uh, you know, a 10 in a descriptive profile is going to be the same as a 0.5 ppm that we're pulling out of a GCMS. It's essentially normalized. Um, and the statistical method will then sort the yeast strains and also the individual metrics themselves based on their similar, similarity to each other. So this is a really nice method for visual assessment of differences. You can now start to piece together because the, the program did all of this work for you to show you these strains are similar, these strains are different, and here's why. And you can start to piece together the patterns of, of what these yeasts are bringing to the table. So for example, you know, if you take a look at the heat map um, in, in, in my presentation, we had a cluster of strains that were similar in that they were high attenuators and high ester producers. Whereas you can see other strains that were clustered close together, those were low attenuators um, and higher infusal alcohols. Um, so you really start to see what strains are falling into similar categories and what strains are falling into different categories. Um, if you also take a look at the ranked or the sorted list of yeast strains, if you look at what's on top and what's on bottom, those are the two most yeast strains that had the most, or the two yeast strains that had the most differences between them. So in this case, just a really quick look at the color map, you can see, oh, the house ale was the most different from hothead ale. They were two completely different performers, um, which is really exciting to see uh, uh, that kind of comparison between the two. And um, I'll just jump into the PCA plot quick. Um, similar information, it just gives you kind of a different way of looking at things. Uh, principal components or PCA is essentially a plot which will take your multi-dimensional multi data, this data coming from multiple sources, and basically force it into two dimensions based on the two components, which are unknown and not defined. 
that drive the most variance or difference in, in all of the variables that you're including, yeast strain, and then all of the data that we've collected. And this enables us to see where a certain yeast falls with respect to others based on all of the data that we've collected. So let's say, for example, we're looking at the PCA plot uh, in the presentation. Maybe we had a, a target for a high attenuator and a high ester profile with juicy and fruity coming from our descriptive panel. Did we see any of the strains that were thrown onto this plot that shared similarities to those targets. And indeed we do. We can look at the, the overlay of the yeast strains on this plot and we can see that, uh, that Nottingham and Hothead might be strains that would be appropriate for the specific brand target that we're looking for. So, you know, we had this question before that, oh, it kind of looks like Nottingham and Hothead you know, might be very similar to each other. And indeed when we put this you know, incredible mathematics to work it turns out that, uh, you know, our human-based assumptions were on the right track, but we now have the data to support those assumptions, which is really cool to see. Oh, my goodness. I mean, I, I can just think of all of the ways that this can be applied, you know, in, in you know, like I said, not just home brewers, but, but uh, not just commercial brewers, but all the way across the spectrum. I mean, if you had this kind of information and you don't have to do, you know, uh, you don't have to have all of uh, the 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 GCMS and and um, you know those advanced sort of tools for measuring this is you know like you said you're asking here a brand target and then you ran, you were able to run um, in this instance through that computer program and identify two yeast strains that were different from your house ale um, and and say okay these two strains meet exactly what we want so let's try to see what happens if we scale this up I mean that's just so powerful and and then to have that data and say, look, here's where we we went through. Like we compared all ten of these strains, and of these ten widely available strains, these two are the ones that would be ideal for this brand target. I mean, how cool, right? And why? And, and my question again is, why aren't brewers sort of doing this? Why isn't this the way we're approaching we're approaching it? Seems like we're backwards. We're approaching it as malt and hops. And then just saying, oh, yeah, just throw a yeast in there. <laughs> oh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm on board with you, Cade. And, and I will say I don't want to neglect the complexity that, you know, more yeast strains would bring to a brewery. I understand that there's, you know, concerns about cross-contamination. There's concerns about being able to meet production schedules and things like that. But, you know, I really challenge breweries to see what yeast can do for you that you that you've seen from from raw materials other raw materials hops and malt i truly believe that there's so much diversity out there that we're just not exploring and i think a lot of that comes from fear and and a lot of it comes from knowledge that if you have an issue with cross contamination that's going to be a big issue but you know i think with intelligent design and intelligent approach you can make uh, you can find a yeast strain that you can bring into your brewery that's not going to be dangerous that that would just bring a really fantastic new identity to the brands that you're producing. Yeah, I love it. And especially, you know, even some on the on the opposite side with new yeast strains, right? Uh, like think about uh, supply chains as well. And I'm sure you've you've thought about this as well. Um, you know, if, if a yeast suddenly is in uh, less supply or goes up or becomes cost prohibitive, if you've got a yeast that performs similarly in the same amount of time from a different, um, you know, uh, supplier or manufacturer, you now have additional options for continuing to produce the same or similar behavior that you've been doing. Absolutely. If you are a brewer, I mean, you have the opportunity to have your own yeast catalog. You can jump into that and you have all of this data that you can use to, to address issues like that. I mean, supply chain, we're in COVID now. Supply chain was a big topic. It still is that, you know, we ran into issues in multiple avenues um, with respect to brewing materials, even up to cans. And, and that yeasts are not independent from that. So if you have this information at your fingertips, you're much, uh, much more capable of addressing risk and addressing problems than you would if, if you didn't take the time to do this. So I, I think, you know, from multiple avenues, this is not only exciting and fun to do, it also helps you out in the long run. All right. Well, it's time for the hard question. And I ask, I've started asking this question to all of my guests. Um, and so if you want brewers to take away just one thing from today's episode, given all the stuff that we talked about, what would it be? <laughs> so I hope the brewers out there would take away that there is a feasible method at your fingertips, theoretically, for you to begin trialing the wide variety of yeasts that are out there. And, you know, I hope they would take away the challenge to see for yourself 
if you strain diversification in your brewery can contribute to product and process innovation and overall diversification of your portfolio. I love it. I love it. Well, um, Maria, is there anything else you want to share about uh, the study or that we didn't get into today? The only thing I would say is, you know, I encourage you to take a look at some of the other published studies conducted at Sierra Nevada. A lot of those use this type of methodologies in them. So if you want to see different applications of the bench screening, the work is out there. And just give a final shout out to the people at Sierra Nevada, the R&D and quality teams um, for their support in this work. Excellent. Well, Maria, thank you so much uh, for joining us in the Brew Lab. This was uh, so much fun today. Thank you, Cade. I really enjoyed talking with you. It's a fantastic subject and I appreciate being able to reach out to your listeners. All right. Well, cool. Well, listeners in the show notes, you will find a link to Dr. Mutsuglu's presentation at the 2018 San Diego Brewing Summit. Uh, The presentation was titled Expanding Your Yeast Library, Bench Scale Yeast Strain Screening for Performance and Organoleptic Diversification. If you've got questions or feedback, send me an email to Cade at Brewlosophy.com and be sure to check out Brewlosophy's other show, The Brewlosophy Podcast, as well as the experiments and other fun things we're doing over at Brewlosophy.com. The Brew Lab is a production of Brewlosophy, where they who drink beer think beer. Don't forget to visit Brewlosophy.com to read about our weekly experiments and other brewing adventures and listen to us talk about it on our other show, The Brewlosophy Podcast. Thanks to all of our sponsors and patrons that help make this show possible. If you'd like to receive a reward for helping us do what we do, visit patreon.com slash brewlosophy to see how you can do just that. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back in the Brew Lab with another guest next week. Until then, think beer.